about the rainbow papaya and how it was developed and, and why and how it works. Yeah, here, this here is the rainbow papaya and um, this actually was uh, first developed in 1995. But I'll go back to the original uh, beginning so that you can get a really a feel as to why we did this. You know, I just uh, gone to Cornell University from the University of Florida in 1978. I come back to uh, Hawaii and the dean of the College of Ag uh, talked to me and said, Dennis, um, the virus is in Hilo, right here, and in Pune, about 19 miles away, uh, there's no virus. Uh, what would happen if the virus gets into Pune? And I said, you get wiped out. And that started. So he asked me, Dennis, could you uh, do some work to try to control it? So starting in 1978, we started to work to control it. We first purified the virus, developed antibodies, developed a rapid detection test. Then in 1985, 84, 85, the concept of pathogen-derived resistance was formed actually by one of my colleagues at uh, Cornell University, John Sanford. He coined the uh, were parasite-derived resistance or pathogen-derived resistance. An idea was that if you take a small part of the pathogen, let's say it's a virus, a small part of the virus genome, and somehow get it into the papaya, then that papaya would be resistant because the gene of the pathogen is in the papaya. That's why they call it uh, pathogen-derived resistance. Now, way back in 1960, that would have not been possible, but with all the advances in molecular biology, gene cloning, gene transfer, transformation, it was just about the right time that we could try this. So, myself, Richard Manzart, Maureen Fitch, and Jerry Slidem, a molecular biologist, we got together and said, well, let's try to develop a genetic engineered papaya that would be resistant. So we cloned the gene, sequenced it, engineered it into a plasmid vector. Now you could use a bacteria, agrobacterium transformation to get the gene into the chromosome of the papaya. Or again, my friend John Sanford and his colleague had just then uh, invented the gene gun. So since he was right across the street from me, we said, well, let's try the gene gun. So in 1988, 1988, Maureen Fish and uh, Richard Manzar do the embryo, they got the embryos, somatic embryos, the tissue culture. They travel over to Cornell at Geneva, where I was. Jerry Slidem comes. We do all these experiments in 1988. We do the first bombardment of embryogenic cali with the papaya ring spot code protein gene. And we go through all of this and we transform, uh, we're trying to transform the capojo, the dominant variety, and also the sunrise. To make a long story short, 1991, I still remember Maureen Fish says, hey, we got some. Cali, so plants that are transgenic, we know that they're transgenic because the genes are in there. So she sends me some of these plants. So at Cornell, April 1991, there's this line, a transgenic line that we call 55-1. We inoculate, grew it out in the greenhouse, and had a non-transgenic, transgenic line 51 and I inoculate that thing with the papaya ring spot virus. One week later, I go back, and you know, symptoms don't show. I say, oh well, still symptoms not showing in the control, and in line 55-1, then about eight, nine days later, I go back, and I say, oh my gosh, the control showing some symptoms, and line 55-1 still looks okay. Then three weeks later, oh my goodness, you can see the difference. I said, oh my, it was almost like magic that this transgenic line was resistant to the papaya ring spot virus from Hawaii, April 1991. 
So it wasn't magic, it was science. It was science. Uh, and, and the hypothesis, pathogen derived resistance, you go through all the experiments, you get the stuff, you get, you check, hey, there's the gene in there, you inoculate it, and the hypothesis works. So, now this is what I want to tell you. This is what separated us from the men from the boys. Most scientists would get that. They say, oh, here's a plant. Now I'm going to plant it out. I'm going to grow it up for a year. I'm going to get seeds. I'm going to see how that thing is inherited. And then maybe uh, three years from now, I'll do maybe a bigger trial. But I say, you know, no, 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 let's not do that. Because my professor always said, what have you really done? And my idea of research, you go for the enchilada. You go for the being, you go for the juggler. So we cloned line 51. Tissue culture, marine fish made clones of this. 1992, April 1992, we got permission from APHIS. Richard Manzard starts a small field trial, about an eighth of an acre in Waimanalo. Now this is April 1992. We started the field trial of 55-1 and the others. Then, I'm in Guam in May 1992. Fly, me and Steve Ferreira flying back from Guam, landing on me, carrying uh, Pitts, Steve technician, meet us at the airport, and my son was there. He said, hey, Steve and Dennis, you got to go to the big island. I said, why? They think the virus is in Pune. She that right. We catch the next plane. Go to the big island. Go in Pahoa. We drive the, and then we drive down. The, oh my God. The long awaited invasion of the virus that occurred. Infected trees. Make a long story short, Hawaii goes into action, try to eradicate, try to control. All kind of efforts done. Did not work. October 1994, they give up. They say we cannot control the virus spreads like wildfire in Kapoho. Now, here we are, the field trial in Waimanalo. By December, we put a field trial in April 1992. By December 1992, oh, line 51 going beautiful. Transgenic, non transgenic line. In fact, we say, oh, we got something. Now, the other big thing, Richard Manzar utilized those plants and began to develop now this famous rainbow. The industry wanted a yellow flesh, orange flesh. Our line 51, 55-1, was a sunset or like a sunrise, red flesh. So he crossed, and, and it was female, so he crossed the transgenic line, 51, 55-1 red, with the yellow line, the common Kapoho variety. Mm -hmm. Now, since you know, yellow is dominant over red. When he makes the cross, a hybrid becomes orange and yellow. And this here is the rainbow, and you get hybrid vigor. 1995, within three years, he has a rainbow by ready to go. So then, I'm sitting in a conference in Monterey, California. Everybody's talking, and they fax me from Hawaii. They say, you know, Senator, you know, he wants to put money, and they want to cut down all the trees in Puna, all the trees in Puna, and for five years, they're not going to plant anything, and then maybe they plant papaya again. I said, oh my gosh, I'm not sure if that's going to work. Or not. So I talked to an APHIS person. I said, you know, do you think it's possible that we can put a field trial for all of our papaya in Pune? And he said, if you send in an application, we send in an application, and then we put the field trial on Rusty Perry's farm. Steve Ferreira led the field trial. So uh, Richard Manzard had developed the rainbow. Now the homozygous red flesh 55-1. We call it sun up. We put a field trial in uh, Kapoho, in Rusty Parish Farm, and the rest is history. Oh my gosh. 
in six, seven months, all the non-transgenic plant infected, the rainbow plants going through. The farmers look at it and say, oh my gosh, where can we get this fruit? Now the other big thing we did, a scientist. We had entered the red zone. We do beautiful science, but the farmers cannot get it. It had to be deregulated. Nobody has money, so we had to fill out all the paperwork to APHIS, EPA, FDA. Do all, I, we had, I had to read all what had to do, all doing all of this stuff. Late 1995, we submitted. By the end of 1996, APHIS deregulated the papaya. Uh, beginning of 1997, uh, EPA deregulated the papaya. We finished consultation in about September 1977. We got all that done. And then the industry starts to raise some seeds in anticipation that we would get it commercialized. But one of the biggest problems, they said, oh my gosh, we got to get all these licenses from these different companies. Well, some was Monsanto since they had the uh, NPT2 gene, the 35S promoter, and all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And I told the growers, you know, hire a lawyer. Uh, tell these companies, hey, we need help. And inside of a year, about a year after they went to see the companies, they got all intellectual property rights. And in May 1st, 1998, we had a celebration here in Hilo. That's when the first rainbow and sun of seas were released to the growers free. It was a public sector development. And everybody was happy. And from then on, they started planting and it turned around the industry. From 1992 to 1998. 1992, Hawaii is producing 53 million pounds of fresh papaya. Puna represents 95% of the industry. Six years, 1998, of the virus, Hawaii is down to 26 million pounds, 50% down. Wow. And nearly all of the papaya are infected, so the quality is not good. The papaya is released May 1st, 1998, and that started the reclamation. And my wife did a voluntary uh, master's degree for the state of New York. She documented the adoption of the papaya. She, she went to nearly 70% of all the farmers, asked them, why are you going to do this? So she documented all of that. And uh, really, you know, so from 1998 to now, you go to Pune and you see healthy papaya. Now, this is 2013. There's a bill to now ban all rainbow papaya in the Big Island. It's beyond my comprehension that this would happen. But this is why we did it. We did it to help the people, a public sector work. And uh, we all feel that we help. And uh, I, I think if you go and see farmers now, they'll testify that they were saved by this uh, genetically engineered papaya, rainbow and the sun of papaya, developed just by some ordinary uh, public sector scientists like us. That's the story. And it's an amazing story. And it's also a delicious papaya. Absolutely, <laughs> the best papaya in the world. <laughs> Well, thank you very yeah, much. Yeah, and, and th thanks very much for coming. I, I've enjoyed this. So have I. It's a real treat. Yeah. Okay. Mahalo. Mahalo.